All right. Well, thank you. Um, it is 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Sarah Pike. I'm with Common Enterprise Development Corporation, and I will be your facilitator today. Welcome, everyone, to the Shared Services uh, Cooperative Webinar sponsored by Cooperation Works. Um, just to make sure that we were, were all sort of on the technical same page, right now your screen, you should um, show the title uh, slide, which has Shared Services Cooperative Cooperative, the Cooperation Works topic call with the date, presenter, facilitator, and files and recording. As you can see, this um, webinar is being recorded and will be available to you after the webinar. Um, you can find it on the Cooperation Works website, and I'll type that um, website into the chat box in case you don't know it. Um, right now, all the participants are um, or uh, all the attendees are muted just to cut out any background noise, but if you have any questions, I'll go through that process um, in just a little bit. But first, um, I would like to run through the agenda. Uh, we'll go through the learning objectives quickly, and then we'll have a presentation from Marilyn Scholl, the manager of CDS Consulting Co-op. Um, that'll be followed by some additional thoughts and brief comments by Kevin Edberg from CDF and Adam Schwartz from the National Cooperative Business Association. And then we'll use the remainder of the time for question and, and answer. If you look on the right side of your screen, um, there's a questions tab. If you click on um, that and you, you can enter in a question, once we get to the questions, we'll, we'll go through those questions in the order in which they were uh, received. And Joel, um, our technical support with us on the call today, will unmute you so you can go ahead and um, ask your question to the presenters and then um, any follow-up um, discussion. So uh, with that, let's move ahead to the learning objectives. First, we're going to look at the CDS Consulting Co-op as an example of a shared services co-op. We'll take a step back and look at the broader picture of shared services co-ops um, in other industries. And then we'll look at some components, uh, such as key issues in developing, as well as tools and resources needed to support uh, shared services co-ops. So let's begin with the presentation. I'd like to introduce uh, Marilyn Scholl. She's the manager of CDS Consulting Co-op. She specializes in leadership development, board training, facilitation, membership development, and policy governance. She has worked with food cooperatives for over 25 years, including nine years as the general manager and nine years with the University of um, Wisconsin Center of Co-ops. Take it away, Marilyn. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah, and thanks, everybody, for being here. It's a, a pleasure to tell you a little bit about our co-op. Um, I am not an expert in shared services co-ops and don't pretend to be, um, but we uh, found it to be a very useful model for our particular group, and I'm happy to tell the story of CDS Consulting Co-op as an example of a shared services co-op and uh, kind of what we've learned along the way. This is a a picture of our consulting co-op members taken at our annual retreat uh, last June in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. Here's uh, I'm here. Uh, Joel Brock, our technical support guy, is here in the front. And uh, Kevin Edberg is the man behind the camera. Mm -hmm. I guess you can't see him as well. Uh, but the rest of these are our members. Our, our members are dedicated to, to uh, working with cooperative businesses. Uh, many of us have been involved with uh, food co-ops and providing consulting services to food co-ops for many years. Uh, we have 20, uh, over 20 consultants all together. 21 of them are members. Uh, together we have two, over 200 uh, combined years of food co-op consulting experience and an average of 22 years in the food co-op industry. So we're a fairly uh, experienced group. Uh, we also have some new members. Uh, so that's, uh, that makes that average um, pretty high. Um, these are the areas of services that we specialize in providing to our clients, to food co-op clients, uh, services in the areas of expansion and growth, improving uh, performance, that's uh, store operation, financial performance, leadership development and governance, uh, board of directors training, basically, and um, membership development and member capitalization. Some of the programs and services that we offer uh, CBUILD, Cooperative Board Leadership Development, is a program that offers um, ongoing, continuous support to food co-op boards of directors. We started with 24 co-ops participating in 2005, and that's now grown up to 78 uh, co-op boards participating. 
That support includes 15 hours of ongoing telephone consultation throughout the year, a one-day annual retreat at the location of the choice of the co-op, uh, regional 101 sessions for new directors. We offer nine uh, sessions around the country. We have one coming up Saturday in Vermont, and I just found out we have over 50 people registered for that session. We think that we've had over 1,300 people who are directors of food co-ops who have been through our 101 session over the last five years since we've been running the program. Um, it also includes a library of resources that is available that includes webinars like this one, um, field guides, and other kinds of resources that we develop and make available to the CBUILD clients. Another program that's been a little longer in um, operation is the COCOFISC, which stands for Common Cooperative Financial Statement. Uh, that's a program that gathers uh, financial and operating data for co-ops and allows them to uh, benchmark, identify top performers, uh, find out what the median uh, results that are attainable are, and to help co-ops kind of Im improve in order to um, hit the benchmark target that they're looking for. In the early uh, 2000s, there's a new wave of food co-op development that started to emerge, and many of you folks in, in uh, co-op development centers, I'm sure, are aware of this movement. Uh, it's just continued to grow. We're aware of over 300 groups around the country that are trying to get a food co-op started in their community. So together with uh, Cooperative Development Services, the food co-op consultants um, work to develop a model uh, called Four Cornerstones in Three Stages to help support that development. Um, in addition to that model, we have uh, fee-for-service um, opportunities available both for startup and existing co-ops, including market analysis, financial feasibility, uh, other kinds of uh, financial services uh, or startup services that are available there. And our last primary area of services are, is in the area of improving performance, where we offer human resource consulting, uh, staff audits. Uh, staff satisfaction surveys, management training, um, margin productivity, a uh, produce department. It's, it's just a small list, but uh, to give you an idea of the kinds of services that we offer to our clients. A little bit about our history. Uh, we began in 1987 uh, providing service to food co-ops through the um, Cooperative Development Services, which was then known as the Wisconsin Co-op Development Council. And then in 1991, uh, that organization was reorganized as CDS, and we began to focus a team of people within that group to uh, focus on cooperative food cooperative development. I joined in 2000 and became uh, the coordinator of, uh, actually I joined in 96, uh, sorry, as a consultant, and then in 2000 I became the coordinator of our services, and at that time we began publishing our newsletter uh, solutions. And then in the mid-2000s, 2003 and 4, there was a major reorganization of the National Cooperative Grocers Association, uh, which is uh, the primary association for food co-ops in the United States. And uh, we facilitated that transition. And that's also kind of the beginning of the wave of new food co-op development. In 2008, uh, we decided to leave uh, CDS and reorganize as CDS Consulting Co-op. It was a uh, friendly departure, and uh, we're very grateful that um, Kevin and Cooperative Development Services allowed us to keep the initials, uh, both as a symbol of uh, how we had been known previously and as um, a testament to the, the or ongoing organizational alignment. Uh, since that time, we've grown to 21 members and have had a 35% growth in revenue since we became a, a shared services co-op in 2008. That uh, transition took us about a year. Uh, we started talking about it in April 08, and uh, we d made the decision in June. We incorporated in July. In September, we started doing business as uh, CDS Consulting Co-op. And I would say that by about April of 2009, we were fully transitioned into the new organization. Um, we have a good reputation with our clients. This data is from a survey we did uh, last April um, showing, asking our clients um, their perception of our services. Uh, we also ask them 
uh, to just top of mind identify words that they associated with us, and these are the most common clusters of words that were identified. So this is, uh, these are the kind of things that we try to build our common brand identity around. Our co-op uh, uses policy governance as a, a governing tool for our co-op board of directors. We also use a policy governance in our consulting with uh, boards of directors of food co-ops. And um, in policy governance, one of the types of policies that a board will develop is their ENDS policies which describe what the organization should accomplish. Uh, not what it does, but what are the outcomes, what are the results of the work that it does. And so our overarching goal is to uh, support a growing and diverse network of cooperative businesses for the greater good of our members and the overall food co-op community. And that is really uh, why I decided to join Cooperation Works, was to become a, a, a better partner in that uh, growing diverse network of cooperative businesses. As we look to our own future as a consulting co-op, we see opportunities for us to expand our services beyond food co-ops into other kinds of cooperatives. And I just am looking to um, build our experience and understanding of co-ops in other sectors. Under that overarching statement, we have two uh, primary aspects of our business. One is about the service that we provide to our member consultants, that we we provide a right livelihood for our members. And the other is that the result of our work makes the co-ops that we serve stronger in these particular ways. So under the right livelihood, the kinds of services that we provide to our members um, are in the, in the big areas of promotion and administration. We really um, promote a common brand identity and within that identity, we also promote each of our individual consultants. The um, co-op acts as an agent for the consultants so that the consultants do business with the clients and the co-op acts as their agent and, and uh, arranges for administration and, and billing. So we need to promote both the, the individual and the co-op. And the way I think about it is that we, we promote the um, the co-op that stands behind all of the consultants so that the client sees the individuals, but behind the individual sees the co-op and sees that we're all connected and sees the value that that connection brings to the services that we provide. We, um, that also is apparent on our website. We have a group website that also includes individual pages for each of the individual consultants. We publish a uh, newsletter every other month called Solutions. We're in our 11th year of publishing that. Um, another service that's available to our members through affiliation is uh, being connected with other organizations. Like our CDS Consulting Co-op is a member of the National Cooperative Business Association, for example. And so all of our members are able to get uh, copies of the, of the excellent newsletter, CBJ, and other um, benefits of NCBA membership. The same with other organizations that we belong to as a, as a co-op. Uh, then on the administration side, we handle billings and collections on behalf of our members. Uh, we offer um, errors and omissions liability insurance for our members. We provide uh, technical support. Um, Joel Brock, who's providing us tech support today, is our tech support person, and he is available to any of our consultants anytime they need help with the technology issue. Um, we provide uh, web tools such as this GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar, um, SurveyMonkey, other kinds of uh, web tools that our consultants can use when they're serving clients. Uh, other subscriptions and other resources, um, subscriptions to Club Grocer Magazine, access to the COCOFIS data. I mentioned that before. That's a real advantage of being involved with our co-op is that we do have access to that data and can understand uh, both how our clients are doing, what kinds of problems they may be facing, and whether or not the, the results of the work that we've done has improved their situation. So we're able to track all of that. Uh, we offer uh, skill development for our consultants on an as-needed basis. Um, and probably the uh, one of the most important and most 
intangible of our benefits is the opportunity to have peers, colleagues to collaborate on a project. Um, all of us are independent, self-employed consultants, but by being affiliated with the brand and with the others within CDS Consulting Co-op, we can expand our expertise, our ability to um, bring diverse perspectives to um, an issue. So that if, if I'm working with a client and I'm not quite sure the best course of action, I can just check in with uh, some of my colleagues and get a, a good wide range of support around how to approach that. So we feel it gives us not only a great deal of personal support, uh, but helps us provide better services to our clients. Uh, then uh, the other two related to our cooperative structure, the patronage uh, dividends is another benefit that we offer. Uh, we have been uh, profitable in the two and a half years, uh, each year of the two and a half years that we've been in existence, um, in addition to the 10 years that we were in existence under Cooperative Development Services, but since we've been a co-op, we have been able to distribute um, the sh uh, member shares of those uh, profits. And then, of course, participation in the co-op. We have uh, five members of the co-op that are elected to serve on our board of directors. We also have one appointed director, and Kevin Edberg is our appointed director um, serving on our board. In uh, thinking about preparing for this webinar, I tried to think about uh, what are some of the things that worked for us as a shared services co-op that might be relevant to other types of shared services co-op. Uh, and this is the, the list that I came up with that I think has been part of why we've been successful. Um, one is in relation to our, our clients, our target market, that we have a a well-defined and relatively easy to access target market. The, there are about 300 food co-ops in the United States. We know where they're all located. Uh, we know most of the people who are involved with them, the managers and the presidents of the board of directors. They are members, um, it, over half of them are members of the National Co-op Grocers Association. Uh, they belong to uh, CJIN, and they participate in um, the listservs that support uh, food cooperatives. They subscribe to Cooperative Grocer Magazine. So there's an easy place for us to, to put our message and to reach our target audience. An another reason for our success, I think, is that we have a well-established reputation for expertise. Uh, we have been working with, with food co-ops a long time, those 200 combined years, an average of 22 years of industry experience, and um, we're very careful to serve our clients well and to bring in new people that will enhance that image. It's, um, I can't say enough about how precious that is to us. Most of our business, from our survey, we also learned that most of our business comes from word of mouth, that um, in spite of the investment that we do make in promotion, most of it is um, referrals from either another consultant or from another client, and so that reputation is really critical to success. Uh, another part of our success is that when we are successful working with the client, that tends to make them more able to purchase more of our services. So for example, we have um, services in the area of improving performance, so that if a co-op is struggling financially and we're able to help them and then they're able to solve that financial problem and grow, then they might need to hire our services in the areas of expansion and growth to do a feasibility study for an expansion. Um, if that expansion is uh, successful, it may lead to them uh, seeing the need for greater services in, an, in another area where we offer uh, support. So that it's not the kind of business where if we are successful in fixing the problem, then we're no longer needed. We're offering a service that, and maybe it's because of the diversity of service that we offer, um, but when we offer a service, it often leads to a deepening of the relationship and more business opportunities with that client. I think another thing that has worked for us is our co-op structure. Um, all of us being involved with working um, in and for co-ops understood and valued the cooperative structure. Um, but the clarity that it is 
brought to us in terms of ownership, the equity investments, patronage dividends, the participation in governance has all been uh, very valuable and contributed to our success. Um, I didn't mention before, but uh, related to equity, um, it was uh, an interesting process to figure out what the right equity requirement for our co-op was. We, we are not a capital intensive business, so we didn't have a lot of capital needs, but in the transition from Cooperative Development Services to CDS Consulting Co-op, we did have some cash flow needs, and so we looked at what kind of um, equity investment would we need for members in order to help us through that cash flow transition. We also wanted our equity investment to be significant enough that it was um, meaningful uh, to people, uh, but not so high that it was onerous. So that was the, the process that we went through to determine our, our equity requirement. I think another thing that's worked for us is the balance between tangible and intangible uh, benefits for members. They're both very practical things that people can point to and say, it, you know, it saved me money to have that service provided by the co-op. And then there's the intangible that it allows you to uh, get better at what you do, which allows you to generate more business for yourself and to have colleagues and um, opportunities to collaborate on projects. So that's the, having the balance of both the tangible and intangibles, I think it's been a very, very beneficial for us. Another was the clarity that our co-ops act as an agent for the members so that we see our job as the co-op as making it easier for our members to focus on serving their clients. So anything that we can do that makes it allows them to focus more on serving clients and less on their own business administration, that's what we try to do. So that's that was the um, motivation behind last year adding the tech support service that all of us are experts in in cooperatives in one way or another, but not all of us are experts in managing our computers or getting our email attached every day. And so rather than uh, have each of us struggle with that, we brought in a tech support person to help support our members. So, so the focus that our co-op's job is to support the members, our members' job is to provide service to the clients, and the co-op acting as that agent um, helped bring more clarity to that relationship. When we first separated from CDS, we we didn't really know what kind of co-op we were going to be. I, we actually thought we were going to be a workers' co-op because we did work. Um, but in, in looking at it and setting the structure, we realized that we weren't a workers' co-op because we weren't employees. The co-op had no authority over its members to direct their activities. We didn't want to have that authority or supervise their work. Um, we just wanted to want quality control, but beyond that, um, Members make their own decisions about how they set their pricing, uh, what their um, uh, expense reimbursement policies and other things like that, Each what kind of work they want to do, uh, that's determined by the member. Um, but the co-op acting as the agent then allows the money to flow in the direction from the co-op to the member. So we collect all the funds, we do the billing, we collect the funds, and then we pay the members. So that uh, creates the right psychological relationship that we're not trying to collect the co-op share from the members, we're paying out the share. And I think in setting up a shared services co-op, that's something that I would definitely uh, recommend consideration for. The other thing is finding that sweet spot between what the co-op uh, needs to charge in the, in the fee split. Uh, how much do we need to operate our co-op to provide the services that our members want without putting them in a, in a situation that would make their pricing um, non-competitive. So uh, that was another challenge in finding that right balance between um, uh, those two places. And I think we found that we maintained the same relationship that we had prior with CDS. We also have options for both members and non-member consultants. Uh, typically, when we bring a new person on, we bring them on first as a non-member, uh, try them out, get some pilot projects going before we take them on as a full member, and um, 
and promote them fully as a member of our co-op. I mentioned this before, but the clarity between being a shared services and a worker or another a purchasing co-op, uh, that was important. And I thank Adam Schwartz for helping us figure that out um, a couple of years ago when we were trying to figure this out. Um, and then I think lastly, the other thing that's really worked for us is that finding that balance between branding both the co-op and the individuals, that, that the co-op stands behind the individual consultants. So um, we do have a, a newsletter that I mentioned. I welcome anyone to sign up for it. You can, um, it's a free um, distributed electronic newsletter available uh, through our website, which is cbsconsulting.coop. Um, there is going to be time to answer questions here today. There's going to be some questions that I may not answer um, because this webinar will be available publicly. But um, chances are I would answer that question privately. So feel free to email me uh, with that question. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Sarah to uh, introduce our uh, other panelists to share their perspectives. Great. Thanks so much, Marilyn. That was great. Um, our next speaker will be Kevin Edberg. He's with the Cooperative Development uh, Services. Kevin? Thanks, Sarah. And thank you, Marilyn. Um, as Marilyn mentioned, I've had the opportunity of knowing these folks for a long time, and I've had the uh, uh, privilege of watching them. When I came, uh, first got to know them in 2000, I think there were six members of the team, and I've now got, uh, had the opportunity uh, uh, to watch them grow to over 20. And it's been a, a wonderful opportunity because they're all great professionals and great colleagues, and uh, uh, it's, it's been a real joy. As I thought about this seminar, I, I posed my comments more as um, kind of some observations and some questions, and I'll just share those with you and then uh, pass the baton to, uh, to Adam. Um, the uh, first three are kind of observations from a development standpoint. Um, I think the, the distinction that Marilyn made about the, uh, the distinctions between a worker co-op and a shared services co-op um, is an important one because of the clarity of what the co-op and the, G, uh, the GM of the co-op is responsible for versus what the member is responsible for. And um, I think one of the things, if there were groups out there thinking of using this kind of a service, um, retaining that question and clarity about you know, who's responsible for what and being clear about that in the development of bylaws and the articulation of the, of the value proposition is really important. And I've seen that conversation evolve inside the group. And so if I were sitting down with another group, I think asking them that question about, you know, what do you want the cooperative to do um, on our behalf as, it's, as the agent of the members versus what is the individual responsible for I have a suspicion that most individuals will actually, over time, if the group is successful, look to the co-op to do more than what it technically is accountable for. And that's at least something to, to be uh, uh, thoughtful about. I think a second thing, as I observed the creation of this one, was the question about capitalization. In Mar uh, Maryland's conversation about uh, this not being a capital-intensive uh, enterprise, uh, is pretty accurate, and the, the sense that the money flows from the cooperative to the members, uh, I agree, is, a, is an important design element uh, in the business, that um, it, it puts the incentives in the right places and, and puts emphasis on the right syllables uh, when it comes to um, how do we pay for the organization and who's on the hook for working with good clients because the consultant doesn't get paid if the client did uh, until the client pays you know and so there's there's some design elements and then the whole question of how much capital is needed in this case primarily for for working capital um, and and how does that feed into the equity uh, conversation um, I thought those were all very intriguing from a from a development standpoint in places where um, a developer or a, a new group might go wrong or or might run into some issues, and so I thought there were some useful things there. <clears throat> uh, a third issue that I think is useful in pointing out is this member versus non-member flexibility. 
Um, the cooperative in this situation, being a shared services cooperative, um, its reputation is the sum of the reputations of the, of the collective. And the ability to work with non-members and bring them in and try them out in uh, some pilot projects, as, as Marilyn described, that ability to uh, kind of see how folks work um, is an important part, I think, of vetting uh, the growth. Uh, of uh, of the business and finding you know do you have the right fit and so creating in the in the membership and in the in the business relationship the right structure for how do we work with non-members and using that as a way of vetting potential new members I think is a design element to think about in the uh, creation of any other uh, uh, any other similar kinds of uh, ventures down the road. I guess perhaps a question that I've had uh, around the, the question of shared services is, when does it make sense to, for a group of interested and, and collegial people to form a cooperative versus simply a bunch of people referring business to each other and cooperating? You know, what is, what's the fulcrum? What, what's the, what's the uh, quantum leap that's necessary to jump in order to make it justifiable or, or worth the effort to actually form a cooperative business. Um, I've had some conversations with groups over the past um, where they say, you know, we're, we're a bunch of people in a, in a sector, we like each other, um, and we're happy to carry each other's business cards. And it seems to me that there's a level of cooperation that is possible uh, and needed and right. Um, but there's, but the, the the question needs to be asked: What is the need that the member has that they can't itch? What's the scratch they can't itch um, by uh, simply cooperating? What's the what is the service? What's the need that gets served by the organization that calls the organization into being? I think having conversation and clarity around that, and that's going to obviously vary from group to group and and day to day even, but. Um, Keeping that as a as a part of the focus of the question strikes me as being important. Um, I haven't seen enough of these. I've I've only been involved in conversations with maybe three or four groups over the last couple of years um, as we've looked at this and had experience with it. Um, and CS Consulting Co-op is clearly the the most advanced of them that I've worked with. But the question of what's the um, what's the importance of working inside of a common sector? versus the importance of sharing common skills or complementary skills. You know, when is it, when is the breadth of, of uh, member attributes too wide, or when is it too narrow, or when is it just right? Um, I don't know that there's an answer to that, but I think there's a question in there worth pondering if somebody is thinking about forming uh, one of these questions. Where is that, uh, where's the right synergies and uh, where do they lie? And then the last thing that I've observed and that I throw out for, for consideration is the issue of personal alignment. One of the things that has struck me about this is about this particular example is that this is a cooperative of independent consultants and that it is very clear that they are all independent consultants and each is talented, um, uh, but as, as Marilyn described, each is entitled to set their own fees, do the work in the way that they professionally feel best, etc. But the element that I think is different here than if I had a group of attorneys or a group of somebody else's is that these folks all worked in co-ops or worked with co-ops. And so they understood the cooperative model and knew how to be, how to apply cooperation to balance their independence. And this sense of, um, because of the branding and the, and the reputation, um, how do you find that right fit um, in the personal alignment of members? And how do you, um, to what extent do you incorporate that into your decisions? Um, how does that create a competitive advantage for the group? Um, or when are there, how do you protect against the times when it might become a disadvantage? Um, and how does that 
level of independence interfere with the ability to cooperate? I think there's a, you know, that gets sorted out independently for each group, but that was something that I have thought about as I, as I look at this group and what are the limits of this model in um, doing these kinds of, of projects and, and this kind of work in other places. So those were the things that I have observed and thought about as uh, in preparation for today. And with that, I'm happy to be quiet and throw the ball to uh, uh, back to Sarah. Great. Thanks, Kevin, um, uh, for those insights. Um, our next presenter um, is Adam. Adam, are you on the line? I certainly am. Wonderful. Uh, take it away. OK. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah. And. Um, uh, one of the, the benefits and, and one of the detriments of being on a panel uh, with uh, with Kevin and Marilyn is if you're the third speaker, uh, they've covered just about everything you could possibly cover on this topic. So thanks to both of them for, for the really fine job in, in, in covering this. I was asked um, uh, to participate uh, earlier this week just to, to give a brief update of, of what NCBA is doing in this area. And, uh, and maybe in the discussion uh, answer any questions uh, as, uh, as they may arise. Uh, just so that everyone knows, um, recently uh, NCBA did apply and was granted uh, uh, a development grant uh, from USDA uh, to create a cooperative development center that will be supporting the creation of purchasing and shared service cooperatives. So, uh, this is an area of certain keen uh, interest uh, of ours and that we certainly will be seeking uh, to promote. And the, this development center is going to be a resource for all of the other folks within Cooperation Works and other cooperate, uh, cooperators who are seeking to develop uh, co-ops. So part of my uh, quest here is, is to make a bit of an appeal um, to the folks who are, who are participating in this webinar um, that if there are specific uh, items that you think that you need resources uh, as you go about uh, helping others to create uh, purchasing and shared services co-ops to please be in touch with us so that we can develop that that resource library uh, right from the ground up uh, to be very responsive uh, to those folks who are on the ground uh, doing this this type of development I, I think Marilyn and, and Kevin did a just a, an excellent job sort of you know covering sort of the ground of what it takes for a successful shared services uh, co-op uh, to be created. Uh, I think that the model has, has great appeal. And, and as the success of CDS and, and maybe some others uh, will demonstrate that we will see others um, uh, seek, seek to, to replicate uh, the model as well. Uh, just prior to, to getting on this uh, webinar, um, my colleagues and I were drafting uh, Paul Hazen's testimony that he will be delivering uh, next week um, to Health and Human Services uh, to an advisory panel that they have created uh, for the implementation of the, the cooperative provision of the health care reform bill um, that was enacted last year. And I mention this just to uh, reiterate the unbelievable flexibility that this cooperative business model has and, and the, 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 the just the vast variety of sectors and applications um, that the co-op model uh, has in, in, in different types of businesses uh, all across the country and, and indeed around the world. And I think that the Shared Services Co-op is just another iteration of the flexibility of the model uh, that will allow us uh, to promote uh, the benefit of, of co-ops. And I think that the way that um, you know, CDS Consulting Co-op has, has created their model is, is really a, a very good case study uh, for a lot of folks um, uh, to use and learn from. I particularly appreciate the discussion about uh, the consideration of, of worker co-op for shared services, because I think there is a, a line there that, that you need to distinguish. And I, I think we did a good job of, uh, of clarifying that. And also to Kevin's point about the personalities. And I guess I would urge, as folks are potentially consulting with other groups on the creation of a shared services uh, a, a cooperative uh, to take into account the, the personalities of the individuals that would be involved. Um, I think one of the reasons for CDS's success is that the people were so knowledgeable about cooperatives um, right from the beginning. So that is something that uh, I 
think that needs special attention uh, in doing this with, uh, with potential with individuals who do not have uh, that level of expertise uh, with co-ops. Uh, with that, um, I'll end my comments and, and be happy to, to join in any discussion or answer any questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Adam. Um, we're going to take the remainder of the time to um, answer any questions. Again, if you have questions for any of the speakers, um, just head over to the questions box and, and type it in. Um, we're going to start with the first question that we have from Meredith Rafferty. Um, let's see, and then I, Meredith, I believe Joel is going to give you um, um, audio capabilities, if if possible. Um, okay. Are you on the Are you on the line? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello. So go ahead and ask your question. Um, well, actually, I had a, I had a, a couple of them, and you responded to one. I, I was interested in the um, uh, the uh, co-op financial information, and uh, you listed a website on that. So thank you mm -hmm. um, on that. And then uh, my other question was I. I was just curious. Uh, what, what's a typical uh, fee split between the the um, administrative side of the co-op and the member consultant? We consider that a confidential um, piece of information, so I don't want to put it on this document that will be stored on the World Wide Web. But mm -hmm. if you want, to give, give me a call or email me. I'll be happy to talk about it with you. Okay. Can. Um, is are there some just in general some things that that you consider in that? Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, what does the co-op need in order to offer the services that it needs to offer? How much how much money do we need to take in? And that there's some of those things that are that vary um, mm -hmm. by size, and there are others that don't uh -huh. vary by size. So one of the services that we offer is to pay for each of our members to attend the National Conference for Food Cooperatives. So the more people we have going, the more hotel bills, the more airfares, the more registration oh. fees. But there are other expenses that we have, like our website, that is cost us the same whether we have five people listed or 25 people listed. So it's finding the right balance between the cost that, that we need to provide the services, and then but not having it be uh, such a high split that our, our consultants are priced uh, out of the market. So, so they're still able to offer competitive pricing on their fees, knowing what the fee split with us is. So those are the things we think about in, in balancing it. And we have had the same fee split for about 15 years. And so the, the co-op is willing to look at each of their major areas of service and think about the appropriate? No, we have the same fee split for every project, every consultant. Okay. The only place we have a different fee split is for non-members pay a slightly higher percentage. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. It, it seems to me in the area of the fee split conversation that the cooperative model is particularly well suited to having that, to facilitating groups having that conversation. Um, they, they get to see what the organization is delivering. They get to um, uh, make decisions about what are the appropriate levels of reserves that are necessary to run the business and to ensure that the business is there to meet their needs in future years. And the, the you know, a discussion uh, about patronage uh, distribution and proper reserves and how that impacts with the fl uh, fee split um, is a particularly useful conversation in a cooperative context. Thanks. Um, uh, if there are no other comments on the fee structure. We'll move on to the next question from Audrey Malin about the services with NCBA. Um, Audrey, are you there? Oh. Hello. Are you there? Um, okay. My uh, only question was what kind of services NCBA will be offering to startup groups for purchasing or service cooperatives. This is, this is Adam. Thanks, Audrey. Well, uh, that is uh, very much um, still in, in development. Uh, and we would be very curious as to the types of services um, that 
the co-op developers uh, feel that they would need. Obviously, some, some written resources uh, will be available, um, and there could also be uh, a TA in, the, in, the, in having folks uh, train the trainers. Uh, as well, if uh, if that's an area where where people uh, think that that kind of support would be helpful as well. Great, thanks. I have some great ideas for you, Adam. I'll talk oh. to you later. All right, <laughs> sounds good. Thanks. <laughs> great. Um, our next question. There's uh, two from uh, John Whitman. Um, John, are you on the on the? Yeah. Are you on the air? <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm munching on a card here. <laughs> well, one question is, how many shared co-ops are there in the U.S.? Do we know? Anyone? I don't know. Adam, do you? Uh, no. Uh, that is not uh, one of the difficulties with most co-op sectors is that there's no formal reporting requirement. Um, so, uh, no, I do not know. I, I do know that since we've been in business and, and saying that we're a shared services co-op, I've gotten calls from a, a number of different types of organizations, a um, couple that were involved in uh, computer programming and technical support, a group of graphic designers, a group of consultants to nonprofits, and a group of building contractors. I don't know if any of them followed through and created a cooperative, but they were all curious about our structure. I know Eric um, from out in the Northwest, is, I think you're on the call, Eric, um, just helped in a group of um, mountaineers, I believe it was, uh, organize as a shared services co-op. So, oh, okay. that's really cool. Well, maybe someone ought to put together a, a, some profiles of some examples of shared co-ops and post them. Adam, maybe that's something that you can do as part of your USDA grant. And Marilyn, I have a follow-up question for you, which is, are you posting examples of your bylaws and maybe member contracts that we can have a look at? Uh, I will be happy to post um, uh, the both with some uh, sections blacked out. But you can see the structure and the outline for those. I'll be happy to, to post the general concept, sure. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Um, all right. We're going to move on uh, to Sandra Morales. Mary Kay, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Are you there? Are you on the line, Sandra? Um, well, I'll just go ahead and ask uh, her question. As, as a cooperative, are you or have you been able to place bids for large contracts? Marilyn, I'm... Yes, uh, we have. What, we sometimes we have an individual project where just one consultant works with one client, but we've also had a number of projects where there will be three or four or five uh, consultants working on various aspects of a project, and we've been able to take advantage of those because we had all the people we needed to fill out the range of service. Great. Sarah, this Adam, I would just add that the, it, it's definitely scalable. Um, we have. Uh, purchasing uh, cooperatives made up of independent businesses, which obviously slight difference between shared services, that have recently concluded $500 million contracts. So it's quite scaled. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, OK, a couple more from John, um, if you're still there, uh, regarding construction financing to, to build a building. Are you, are you still on? John Whitman? Sarah, which John? Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. John, well, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I, I am here, and the reason that there's such a delay is because uh, the screen says muted, so I, <laughs> you couldn't hear me. All right, so I'm really interested to know whether um, you, you might provide help with getting financing, construction financing, for, let's say, a building a building a facility such as a cooperative grocery, can you help in getting construction financing? Yes, we have a, uh, several services that would assist there. One service we offer is uh, financial pro formas or financial feasibility. And in that, we look at, we start from a sources and uses document, which identifies what are we going to need in order to get the co-op up and running, and then where are the sources, where's that money going to come from. So that's the, the first step in the process. and then. 
we have a services specialized around um, member capitalization, either member loans or preferred shares or regular member equity. And we have uh, programs to help co-ops achieve a, the portion of financing for their project from, from their members that they need. And that's generally for a startup, we're looking at 35 to 50 percent of the capital needs to come from owners. And then the rest can come from uh, traditional bank financing or sometimes there's grant possibilities. Um, sometimes there's some mezzanine or second tier kind of financing. Uh, so we, we help with the overall conceptualization of the amount of funds that are needed, and then we specialize in the area of uh, owner financing. Okay, that's really interesting. But if I could follow up with a, a, a further probe here to that question, do you find any differences, or I don't know what your experience has been, but do you find that it's, even, it, that it's harder to get financing for projects in, let's say, economically disadvantaged uh, parts of, of a town or a city? Uh, there's definitely uh, more difficulty in the last two years in getting financing for projects. Um, I, for As far as the other question, I would have to refer that to one of our consultants. Uh, Bill Gessner would be the best able to answer that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, our next... Oh, well, well, wait, wait, wait. Oh. I, somebody else was going to jump in, but... Um, when you say there's more difficulty in getting financing for projects over the last two years, is that for projects across the board or just projects in economically disadvantaged areas? Across the board. Okay, thanks. Okay. Not impossible, just been harder. Harder and slower. Right. Even existing uh, co-ops that are trying to do expansion projects, are, it's been harder. It's easier for them than it is for the startups, so. though. And do you know why it's harder? And do you have any recommendations for overcoming those obstacles? Uh, well, I think that it's harder just because uh, banks have, I don't know how to make a polite response to that. Banks have done what banks do. Um, and I think the, the best solution is for us to continue to work with NCBA on creating a cooperative capital fund. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on to the next question from Joe Marafino, I believe is. Um, Joe, are you on the line? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just curious how many of the consultants use the, um, the cooperative as their full-time source of work, or whether they all have, they, they supplement with other consultancies outside of the cooperative? Uh, sure, that's a great question. Um, uh, of the 21 of us, there are probably eight or ten that use the co-op as their primary or perhaps even only source of income and there and the rest uh, so a slight majority have other sources of income uh, we require uh, through our membership agreements that any business with a cooperative any type of consulting they do with a cooperative that they run through the co-op and any other type of, of um, consulting work they can run through the co-op if they choose. Uh, they generally do not choose to do that because of the fee splits, but we, we would be willing to do billing to any other client if, if they wished for us to. But anything with any kind of food co-op or co-op support organization is required to run through the co-op. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Sandra Morales. We had a little trouble getting her on before. Sandra, are you there? Okay, I'll go ahead and ask her a question. Can someone speak to how you monitor the quality of services provided by the members? Is it through <laughs> surveys, evaluation? Uh, yes, uh, both of those, and then also, um, uh, if we particularly if we have a new member um, or an, a new person who's joined us, we we call up, telephone the person that they worked with at the co-op and talk with them about their experience and uh, whether they were satisfied with what they what they got or not. Um, the food co-op community is a relatively uh, small and um, tight community, and, and so it's, um, it's pretty easy to get access to that information. But we formally, we have a client survey that we do every two years, and then we have a consultant survey that's available at any time. On our website, you can just click on uh, Feedback for Consultants. We put that link uh, on all of our invoices and in all of our newsletters so that anytime anybody wants to be motivated 
to, to give us feedback, we accept it, um, but we also are proactive about seeking it. Sarah? Yes? Could I go back to the question before this for just one moment? Sure. Um, it seems to me from a developer standpoint um, that, that identification of what business must be brought through the cooperative versus the business that doesn't need to be brought through the cooperative is one of those critical design questions. Um, and the, the methods for enforcing that um, uh, within the membership agreements uh, or having clarity around that within the membership agreements is a particularly important issue. Um, uh, because people will come, especially in these consulting kinds of positions, people will come from a variety of, of market sectors and the, the ability to link the cooperative, the shared services cooperative, with its target audience, its target uh, market. Um, uh, so much of the issues of quality control, promotion, uh, communication, uh, tangible and intangible benefit, are predicated on understanding the marketplace that you're seeking to serve. And so the free rider question of how do I, you know, is there a possibility of getting all the benefits without having to bring my work through the cooperative um, is one of those issues to be addressed. And the place to address that is in that issue of defining what work um, uh, members need to, to bring through the cooperative and is subject to the cooperative fee split and, and other um, uh, other activities versus what am I free to go out and do on my own? Great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, moving to the next question uh, from Diane Gasway. Diane, are you there? Hello? Diane? Hi, this is Diane. Great, go Can ahead. You hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, my question um, has to do with the uh, comment that Marilyn you made about paying out shares versus collecting shares, and um, I guess I'm a bit dense this morning. I'm not. I, could you clarify that again? Oh sure. Uh, our member shares. Uh, each um, member is required to buy one share when they invest in the co-op. We um, they have one year to make that investment from the time they join, and we can take it through deductions from their pay. So they don't actually have to make any cash outlay. Um, shares are refundable to them when they leave the co-op if um, at the discretion of the board of directors. Hello? Okay. Yeah, I heard him. I can't hear him. Oh. Uh, okay. Diane, I, did you not hear my answer? Yeah, good. Okay, well, maybe we should just go on to the next one, Sarah. Yep, okay, sounds good. Um, the next question um, is from Okana Bringman-Conway, if I'm pronouncing that right, hopefully. Um, are you there? From Hawaii? No? Um, okay, I'll just go ahead and ask her a question. Uh, what advice can you give about... Uh, uh, inviting and training new members, and specifically, they are a worker-owned healthcare co-op. Mm. Any thoughts from the panelists? I don't really have enough experience to address that. Sorry. That's okay. Sarah, did you say that again? Sure. Um, they are a worker-owned healthcare co-op. What advice can you give about inviting and training new members? I guess, the, Sarah, the only thing that I would say is with inviting members is to make very sure that the expectations are very clear up front, that mm -hmm. everybody knows uh, what's expected of them, what the co-op provides, what it doesn't provide. Okay, wonderful. And I would think, I, I know that uh, equal exchange, um, similar to what uh, Meryl mentioned, there's a trial period. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would I would suggest that as well, that uh, that you get to see the, the quality of the work that the, that the folks do before they're invited to be uh, full members. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Um, well, actually, it looks like we're about at 1 o'clock. So um, for those of you that we didn't get your questions, I apologize. Um, Marilyn's email is on uh, the 
uh, webinar materials in Maryland. It's all right if they email you directly if they have any follow-up questions. Sure, it sure is. Wonderful. Um, well, I just want to thank the panelists, Kevin Adam and Marilyn, for their time and, and all the attendees. Um, um, I hope you um, got a lot of information for it. Uh, I found it was informative myself. Um, and again, we'll email out the uh, webinar recordings uh, to each of the people that registered. So if you wanted to go back and listen and look at it again, you'll have that ability. So thanks again to everyone. And um, um, there's no other final comments. Uh,